We'd like to recognize and thank you for your service. I know there are some out there that are shy, but at any rate, let's not forget to honor those who made um, the ultimate sacrifice so we can enjoy the free and safe Thank you. So welcome to Lunchbox. Lunchbox is one of our newest programs here at the Chamber. In fact, it's only the second uh, since we've launched our Chamber Unleashed, the year of the Chamber Unleashed. It is a commitment to provide uh, the best possible member experience to all of you. And uh, we do that through fostering a culture of collaboration and creativity through our committees, uh, through engagement with our members, through community partnerships, and also, I have to admit, an exceptional staff uh, team of professionals who I would like to take a moment to introduce, uh, please, those who are here today. Judy Clark, our benefits member benefits advisor. Raise your hand, Judy. <laughs> <It's awesome. laughs> They're shy, too. Uh, Robert Killen, I believe he's outside still working. Robert Killen's our membership director. He's done a phenomenal job since he came on board just a little under a year ago. And a couple of our new uh, staff members, just all of three weeks as of today, Michael Blackley, right back here in the back, over here, and uh, Paige Sharp. Paige is probably still out there bringing everybody in. We, we're still waiting on a few folks to arrive. So in the meantime, uh, would again like to welcome you and thank you for being a part of the program today. We have an exceptional program, and in fact, I'd like to know who in the room are innovators. Say I. Yes. We're creative thinkers, solution seekers, uh, catalytic leaders. I know that's why you're here. You're here to learn from each other. You're here to hear about what innovation districts, innovation hubs are all about, to imagine and to kind of unleash uh, from what we normally might think about as economic development. And uh, we have an expert panel today that I know you're going to be uh, amazed and inspired when you leave today. So we're going to make it worth your while. This program, Lunchbox, is developed through collaborative work of our chamber standing committees. And at the helm are our committee chairs. Many of them are here today. I'd like to introduce them. And this time, please stand up. Uh, our education committee chair, Nancy Bigley. Our gateway development committee chair, Christy Kernett. I think she's on her way. There's Christy. Our Government Issues Committee Chairman, Bob Fondren. Greeters Committee, Kate Reed. Bill Compton, thank you, Kate. Membership Committee Member, Nick Nelson. And our Economic Development Committee Member, uh, Chair, mind you, Mike Eister, who's greeting everyone. Who's greeting it? Mike, our Economic Development Committee Chair. So we have actually a very broad scope of work to deliver on in the Chamber. And uh, our commitment to the seven core pillars of service, uh, a number of them are which are legislative advocacy, economic development, network development, our business resource access. Uh, these are just to name a few. And we really couldn't do the work that we do without the support of those member organizations like today's uh, program sponsors. And I'd like to thank uh, our three program sponsors today. First and foremost, Lithia Toyota. We're located in our beautiful downtown, uh, historic downtown Springfield. Century Lighting, where are Joe and Suzanne? I saw them. Thank you, Joe and Suzanne, owners of Century Lighting, for sponsoring today. And our Springfield Renaissance Development Corporation. And I know a number of the board members are here today. If you would just stand up and be recognized from Springfield Renaissance Development Corporation, and you'll learn more about these folks. Thank you. A round of applause, please. For And last but not least, I hate to tell you this, it's kind of exciting, but as of right about two minutes ago, Lunchbox has gone global. And I say this, no joke, Mark Davis, thanks to Mark Davis and Joshua Evans of Eugene Tech, they are streaming live today on eugenetech.org, so you can check it out now. But I advise you to check it out later because we have a great program. Thank you, Mark and Joshua, for being here today. Now, Mark has advised me that if Spring, if we want a Springfield Tech, he's got a cookbook that he can make it happen. So we're going to check with Mark later on about his cookbook and figure out how we can bring about uh, Springfield Tech. So thank you again, Mark and Joshua. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Eister. He's a uh, distinguished citizen, I don't know how else to put it. He serves as the Chamber Board 
uh, chair, but he also serves on the Springfield Utility Board, the Lane Community College Board, and the SRDC Board. So Mike, take it away. stated and say how excited we are to have you here. It is our second lunchbox. It's great to see such an uh, excellent turnout. And I know you won't be disappointed. The topic is fantastic and we have excellent speakers uh, on our panel. We, uh, our uh, June issue of the bottom line, our uh, chamber newsletter, is dedicated to the topic of leadership. And what we have here are four leaders in our community to talk about the fact that they recognize that you don't want to leave the excellence of your community to chance. You want to be deliberate, you want to be planful, you want to be intentional. And they are going to talk about some ways in which the uh, great momentum that's already underway in Springfield can be further, can be enhanced, can be even further developed. It's an exciting time in Springfield, and they're going to tell you a little bit more about how it can be even more exciting. Uh, I will introduce you to them, and then I will turn it over to them. Uh, first, we have Henry Fields. He's a workforce analyst with the Oregon Employment Department. Uh, and uh, Henry was uh, he's a graduate of Thurston High School, so he's from right around here. He spent a little time on the East Coast. Uh, from 2014 to 2017, he worked as a project manager for a Massachusetts state agency to develop Regional economies focused on innovation and entrepreneurship. We have Max Sayer, uh, also a graduate of Thurston High School. Go Colts. <laughs> Good one, Matt. Um, and uh, in 2015, Matt joined the Technology Association of Oregon. In fact, he did more than join it, he's the director. And uh, in 2016, Matt was recognized as a 20 under 40 rising business star by the Register Guard. Matt was part of a team that helped secure Mozilla Gigabyte City status for our region. Uh, so uh, Matt's on our panel. Uh, Dr. Sue Ricky Smith is our superintendent of the Springfield Schools. Uh, she's an educator with a passion for students and systems. In 2011, Sue was recognized as Oregon's Middle School Principal of the Year. Crediting this award to collaboration with staff. Um, after sharing her talents as a Salem Kaiser cabinet member, Dr. Sue Ricky Smith joined the Springfield Public Schools as assistant superintendent, where she was quickly named interim superintendent and ultimately became the permanent uh, superintendent. And we are very fortunate to have her. That occurred in 2015. Tammy Fitch is a founding member of the Springfield Renaissance Development Corporation. You may hear us refer to that as SRDC. Uh, Tammy has a 30-plus year career in, as an independent insurance agent, uh, specializing in risk management for public entities. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Marketing and Distribution, Distributive Education from Oregon State University. And, and, and continues to be an avid viewer sports fan. A native Oregonian with a commitment to local issues and community betterment. Tammy's a past city councilor, uh, LTD board member, a current member of Rotary, the Chamber, founding member of SRDC. Tammy enjoys traveling with her husband Mike and spending time with their three, da their three daughters and five grandchildren. So this is our uh, expert panel here. And I'm going to start us off with just a little video, and then uh, after that, Henry will take it over. I'm going to turn this so that you guys can see it. Paige, you told me to click this thing. Is it the red button? We'll see what happens. Uh -oh. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. I'm hoping I didn't blind anybody. Take a tech guy to point this out. Years ago, a worker needed to drive to a secluded research park, work in isolation, and keep ideas secret. Today, proximity is everything. Workers want to be in urban places that are walkable, bikeable, hyper caffeinated, where they can bump into other workers and share ideas. Firms also want to be home to other firms, research labs, and universities in collaborative spaces so that smart ideas can be turned into smart products for the market. 
innovation districts are decentralized productive geography. They are both competitive places and cool spaces, and they will transform your city and the trouble. So I do want to heartily endorse and go Colts. I'm actually a graduate of Marshfield High School in Goose Bay, but I did coach debate at Thursday High School for a long time. Uh, love you some Colts, but go Pirates as well. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today, so that, that video is a great introduction to kind of the general ideas of what we're talking about uh, when we talk about innovation districts, innovation hubs. Uh, but what I hope we can get a conversation started about today is what these sort of things look like on the ground, what the local circumstances uh, kind of indicate about what we should do when we're trying to create an innovative focus for a city or a region. Um, so in order to provide a little local context, I'm actually going to take us to the East Coast of the United States, where I used to work, uh, to provide an anecdote that I think can help people start to think about uh, what we're talking about today. Uh, it might be interesting to some folks in Springfield who may not see, for example, a Boston-Cambridge sort of area you know, spring up overnight in, in Springfield. Um, I was able to work with a lot of regions that were in Massachusetts outside of that kind of Boston-Cambridge nexus. And a great example is the city of Holyoke, Massachusetts, in western Massachusetts. Uh, this, this city used to be kind of the center of the paper-making world. They had uh, millions of, uh, of square feet of mills that are now underutilized as that industry has declined over time. Um, and a really interesting thing has happened in the last couple of years. So a bunch of the research universities in Massachusetts, the heavy hitters, their Harvards and MITs, were looking for ways to increase their computing power. So they had to design a new facility that had high performance computing, uh, in fact, the highest performance computing available east of the Mississippi, and they decided to build fully up Massachusetts, which has some of the lowest, um, some of the highest poverty areas in the entire East Coast. Uh, why did they do this? Well, Holyoke had a couple opportunities that they were able to take advantage of, despite this lack of economic opportunity that was available for local, local residents. One, it was at the cross of a T-fiber connection between Hartford and Boston. And second, as a result of this uh, long history of paper making, they actually had a 150-year-old system of canals that create some of the cheapest hydroelectric power available in the Northeast. So an incredible opportunity arose out of these situations, these historical situations. But it presented an important uh, question for leadership at Holyoke. How do we turn this into an actual economic development strategy? Because a computing center is great, but it only employs about five or six people. You need you know, a security guard, you need somebody that knows how the IT works, but not a broad opportunity base for Holyoke residents. Well, uh, what made this interesting is uh, Holyoke used the Mass Green High Performance Computing Center, the facility that was built in the upper right there, as a springboard to create the Holyoke Innovation District. Uh, had a couple different layers to what it did. First, the computing center, uh, they made sure that the computing center had access to the community, which means they had a public space that was available for no cost and had very low barriers to entry. So people from the community could use it, whether their activity had anything to do with computing or not. So they taught Girls Inc. Um, attendees how to code, but they also held bike repair workshops for folks that were interested. A very wide range of uses. More broadly speaking, they used it as an opportunity to create um, an opportunistic structure that allowed them to pursue local economic development goals. So what that means is they used this as a centerpiece of a strategy that instead of putting a big, uh, you know, economic development plan together that would just sit on somebody's shelf, they pursued local, uh, local entrepreneurship programs. They uh, created a program to market these underutilized mill spaces. And um, that, those kind of strategies have really had a big impact on this former manufacturing center in Western Massachusetts. Every eighth grade student in Holyoke has been through a coding program. They've really seen an uptick in development of these former spaces because people tend to say, you know, if it's good enough for Harvard, it's good enough for me. And um, there have been an increase in the community connectedness around this, what can seem kind of a distant, uh, hard to access thing, a giant computing center. So why do I share that? Well, it's an interesting way to think about how um, local areas can take advantage of these opportunities. And I think Holyoke has done a couple things really well that Springfield might find interesting. So one, this was an opportunistic strategy that was based on you know, what can we do that's easy, that's low-hanging fruit to take advantage of the opportunities that are available here. 
it was built upon, the second it was built upon historical assets, instead of saying, let's just create a new Stanford here, it was based on what was already there, using those assets to their full capacity, a fiber connection, um, this system of dams, uh, hydroelectric power. And third, it had community inclusion built in from the base. And this is really important because they weren't asking the question of who do we wish lived in Holyoke? They were asking the question, how can what is in Holyoke be taken advantage of by the people who currently live here? So uh, I'm hoping we can have a little bit more of a discussion about that, but I, I do want to um, put on my other hat of my current job, which is the Lane County Workforce Analyst for the Oregon Employment Department. It's my job to provide labor market information and economic data to improve the quality of business decisions all across Lane County. Uh, relatively new to the job, but I hope that you will let me know if there's data that you need or information I can provide to you. I just want to provide two pieces of macroeconomic data that kind of support why are we thinking about this right now and what could be the importance to, to our community. Um, so the graph on the left, uh, there's a lot of different ways to slice this data. Do not take this as the gospel, but this is one way of looking at it. Um, this is the level of competitive education required for high-wage, high-demand jobs in Lane County. What we would think of as good, stable jobs you can support a family on. Okay? Uh, you can see about 10% of these jobs have a competitive education level of high school or equivalency. And the current Springfield population, about 45% of people have their highest level of education as high school or less. Uh, which means that there's opportunities to help people get in these other categories, have access to these high-wage, high-demand jobs. Um, as another example, about 17% of the current Springfield population has a bachelor's degree or higher. And you can see, uh, in terms of good jobs that are available today, um, greater opportunity will need to be to pursue these kind of post-secondary training and college degrees to make sure the folks that are here today can take advantage of these opportunities. I'm really excited to hear Dr. Ricky Smith talk a little bit more about the educational aspect of this because um, it's a really crucial part of it. The second graph here talks about the um, the value of mixed-use walkable communities. This is something that has been in the media a lot, and just to provide some perspective, um, you know, we're seeing increasingly folks uh, thinking about where they're going to live based on what kind of amenities are available, including how walkable is an area. You can see the second, if you can read it here, uh, being within an easy walk of other places and things in the community. Uh, about 70% of people think that's an important aspect to where they choose where to live. What's the relationship to employers and to the labor market? Well, uh, employers in the room will know that as unemployment rates continue to decline, it's harder and harder to find the workers that you need. Well, um, increasingly, companies can't afford to just ignore what's going on in the place where they exist. They need to understand that part of their HR strategy is to be able to um, speak to what people want in a place where they want to live. And sometimes having a mixed use, you know, walkable environment is a critical part of that. Um, I have a two graph maximum, and I don't want to bore anybody, so I'm going to hand it off now, but I hopefully can have a little bit more conversation as things go on about um, the opportunities that are available. So I'm going to hand it off to Matt Sanders, who's going to talk a little bit more about the technology side of this, uh, and look forward to talking to everybody more. Uh, that was great. I uh, just learned two cool things from you that uh, maybe we'll, we'll touch on uh, later. So uh, I'm Matt Sayer from the Technology Association of Oregon, and what we do is build community inside the tech industry, and we do that to help tech companies grow, and we do that to increase economic prosperity in our region. Um, gonna get there. Hey, now we're talking. So uh, Eugene and Streetfield are home to over 400 tech companies, and uh, the largest of which is here in Springfield, uh, less than a half mile away. You guys know who that biggest tech employer is? Symantec. Symantec, yes. And over the next 10 years, this sector is uh, slated to grow, and these are Henry's numbers actually, yeah. Uh, it's slated to grow by 28% over the next 10 years. So that means over 2,000 new jobs for local folks. Um, uh, so that, that's pretty exciting. It's the fastest growing sector in Lane County. And uh, I'm here to share a couple of things, uh, the first of which is that tech isn't just a Eugene thing. It's, uh, it's an everyone thing, and you might have heard about the, the Gigabit Cities designation. Um, Eugene joins Austin and Chattanooga and uh, Lafayette and Kansas City, and, and really that selection was based on the collaboration in our region. And, uh, it's, it's really an inclusive conversation, and uh, in part, it was based on the fiber that's in Springfield. 
the Mozilla designation provides grant funding to cultivate learning opportunities. So it's one thing to have this infrastructure. It's another thing to be able to utilize the infrastructure. And I wanted to introduce Craig Worrell. He's back there. That's our new uh, Mozilla gig Gigabit staffer. He heads up the, the Gigabit portfolio for Mozilla, and he's local. And uh, we're very thankful to, to have Craig here. He just started last week. Uh, and I'm going to talk about sort of the outcomes that we've seen here locally, uh, just based on early investments and and sort of, hey, you know, is this just hype? Is there is there actually some possible positive outcomes that are happening in there? Answer is absolutely. There are there are real positive things happening because of these investments. Uh, the first of which is is numeric based. So we have uh, a short list of buildings right now that are connected to municipal fiber. The first one was the Broadway Commerce Center, and CoChops was actually the very first entity that was connected. So a couple interesting things. One is uh, that building is completely full. In fact, all of the buildings that are connected to municipal fiber are completely full. That means zero percent vacancy. I compare that to uh, the average vacancy rate in, in Greater Eugene. It's it's like eleven and a half percent. So so. The data tells us that this infrastructure attracts companies. Um, and in CoChop, since, since Mark's here, I'll talk about CoChop. So their co-working space, second floor of the Broadway Commerce, uh, over $2 million in traded sector uh, income coming into our region. So you walk in there, and it's all those guys that sort of, I guess, chilling out and seemingly just drinking coffee and working on computers. Um, but they're bringing in $2 million into to our local economy. So, so that's pretty great. And they, for the first time, have a wait list. And it's in part due to uh, the world-class infrastructure. Another company, Partnered Solutions IT, they've been on Coburg Road. They moved down. I don't know if you saw them in the Register Guard maybe about a month ago. Um, another company, Moonshadow Mobile, they were the winner of the Willamette Angels Conference two years ago. They got about a half million dollars. And when they were doing their site selection in a recent move, they would only pick buildings that had access to high-speed internet. So it was a choice between Portland uh, and, and a, a building on Lyman Street. Thankfully, we had that infrastructure to keep them. This weekend, there'll be a story about Toba Capital, which is a, a VC-backed portfolio of 50 tech companies. And there's one in particular, uh, Smarsh and Quorum, actually, that is, is growing so much that they need a new space, and they are were attracted to the building that they chose uh, that they'll be moving into next week because of world-class infrastructure. So it, it's more than just hype. They're just in the early days of, of these types of investments, we're seeing tangible, positive um, outcomes. And the network and the investments that have happened on the other side of I-5 um, can pay dividends here in Springfield. So this is a picture of uh, right in the gateway area. So you might see like the little reference point is the pink cross, that's the hospital. And so this fiber network that comes down from Portland into Eugene and then increasingly has connections over to Springfield is making those 55 miles of subs assets much more valuable. And so those same world-class products like gigabit internet for $79 is the market rate. So symmetrical gigabit for commercial entities, it's less expensive for residential. Those same products, those same world-class products can be available, I think they will be available fairly soon in Springfield. Um, so so high-speed internet is, is an ingredient of an innovation district or an innovation hub. And I thought it would be helpful to maybe maybe show like a picture um, uh, rather than typing, talking about like this hypothetical thing. Maybe like, hey, what does it look like? What is a uh, if you took an innovation district and you mashed it into one space, what would that look like? Would that be helpful? Yeah. To see it. Okay. Forty. Kind of like this. <laughs> kind of like this. So it's a space that uh, inspires you when you go to work there. Not only like you as a worker, like. You're going to bring your friend, or you're going to bring someone from out of town. It's that space that you're proud to take them to, that, that inspires them as well, and sends the right message about our community. It would host community events, both sort of social and professional, so like uh, uh, lunch and learns. Um, uh, 
show you another picture, maybe something like this. Coffee. There's free coffee in this place. And tea and beer. So uh, uh, just has really great amenities. And along the wall, maybe you'll have uh, private phone booths and, and a variety of different types of seating that uh, make it amenable to different types of work styles. And another way to, give you to, to characterize this space, um, sort of like a hotel with no bed. You can kind of visualize what that is, like a nice hotel that you went to, um, or, or a house uh, without a barking dog, if you're working from home now, maybe, I don't know. Uh, or maybe like a pub without the karaoke, right, because it has that bar element. Uh, or a coffee shop uh, without, or sorry, with meeting rooms. So it's all those things in a single space that's very attractive to uh, millennials and others that want to uh, uh, share ideas and, and get uh, together with other folks who want to cultivate business ideas where jobs are created and where community is built. So um, that's what it sort of might look like um, in, a, in a visual sense. So uh, thank you. artistic soul and started a project to redo a theater right in the middle of a downturn of the economy what we had originally thought was going to be less than a million dollars six years later ended up 3.4 million the Richard E. Wildish Theater how many of you have been in there awesome it is a gem we love it and we want to see more that will create and feed the soul downtown uh, we have renovated other buildings. We did one on uh, the third block of uh, Main Street. <clears throat> renovated that, sold it. We're now looking at our next project, which we're not quite ready to announce yet, but soon we're looking and we're studying the housing needs to go all the way from the, the low income to the plush urban living to determine if that'll be a component or whether that'll be a separate project. So hopefully with all of that, what we do is we keep reinventing ourselves, keep it alive, keep it new, keep it fresh. So hopefully we'll have an announcement soon. But more importantly, how does education fit in with all this? So Sue, you're up. Okay, with my time. <laughs> Well, I too don't have any slides, but I do have a party gift. Um, so on your table, you'll see a handout uh, that looks very much like this. Uh, and this is a piece that I want to thank our city partners uh, in conjunction with our United Front Advocacy Group. This is a piece that we took back last week to Washington, D.C., talking about the work that we are doing in Springfield in, in partnership. And one of the things that I would point you to is on the back side, you will see a number of partners at the bottom. You'll see uh, Springfield Oregon, the city of Oregon, uh, city of Springfield, you'll see Springfield Public Schools, you'll see the chamber, and then an industry partner, D.R. Johnson, uh, that is in Riddle. The reason I share this with you is uh, thinking about the remarks we made relative to creating spaces where community can come together and work in innovative ways. And I think this current project that we have relative to uh, what is, is known as cross-laminated timber and now known as engineered wood products, 
uh, it has become sort of the nexus for us here relative to exploring those types of innovative relationships. Uh, this product that you see on the front and on the back, this is it actually being installed. Uh, we at Hamlin Middle School, which will open over winter break 2017-18, uh, has already installed uh, these, uh, this product in three of our maker spaces. And what Matt showed you relative to uh, different ways of, uh, and spaces for instruction, that school looked very much like that, sans beer. So, um, <laughs> not to say that the faculty and I would love to do that some days. Um, and so, uh, but the purpose, it was very purposefully done, and it was purposefully done for this reason. The first was the mayor and the city came to us and said, we're thinking about uh, looking at uh, ways in which we can reinvigorate our timber history. And when, she, when the mayor started to talk to me about cross-laminated timber, and all, I could hear the high tech, and I could hear the STEM science, and I said, stop, you had me head, hello, how can we help you? And then from there, um, since we were in the midst of, of planning Hamlin, how do we incorporate that material? And we very purposely placed it in maker spaces. Uh, for that reason, I'm looking at Jonathan and I'm looking at Nancy because they're all part of those, de those decisions as board members. But we intentionally placed it there and we have left it unadorned so that they can actually see how it is constructed. Because CLT was made in a maker space in a university lab. We want our kids to have the same energy and excitement um, about creating the next whatever CLT is. We want that school to be uh, a cutting edge that encourages teachers to up their game, to expand their practice, and to want to engage in different ways with students and with each other. In terms of an innovation hub, the only piece we're missing right now, uh, as we are doing this work in Springfield around very intentionally uh, focusing our current uh, CTE, career technical ed coursework, into uh, organized pathways, the only piece that we're missing is a very intentional partnership with the university. That's where, and on the educational side, you have your business, you have your school's district, and then you have your university partners that are in the same space. Why is that important? It's important for our students as the up-and-coming workforce to be able to sit peer-to-peer -peer with the math sayers of the world and to say, how did you get where you got? What do, I need to be, what do I need to be learning? What coursework do I need to be taking now in high school? What do I need to be doing post-secondarily to get myself there? You need to have the university partner saying, yes, and, and this is how we do it, and learning uh, how they can better instruct in a post-secondary area as well as do their research in front of our students so that they can see what that looks like and how they can be part of the, this makerspace generation. Additionally, it should be a space relative to bringing the community together where industry can come into our space and to, to train alongside of our students or retrain their workforce for the next up and coming sector or expansion of the sector. That's how our students began, begin to appreciate how much work is involved in really having a meaningful career and what they need to do to get there and then to have the mentorship of their teachers, their business partners, and their university partners. So those transitions from um, K-12 out to post-secondary are seamless, um, much what Dr. Golden sitting right here in front had imagined in terms of a pre-K to grade 14, two years post-secondary uh, had imagined in terms of a vision. We are very much in early days around this work. Next week, we'll have an opportunity to sit with the Tallwoods Design uh, Institute and ask them, we've asked them to come down and take a look at our spaces, both at Springfield High School and at Thurston High School, and to tell us where are the gaps in terms of our facility, where are the gaps in terms of potential instruction, so that we can come your direction and you will want to come ours and actually be in situ in, in our facility, training our students and training um, members of the workforce. Additionally, relative to our partnership here uh, with D.R. Johnson, this is in Riddle, and Riddle, Oregon has a very small school district and they cannot afford to attract the types of teachers that they need on site. With the backbone of fiber, uh, we would be able potentially to develop distance learning opportunities in which our partners in Riddle and in other um, or smaller communities in Douglas County, in Curry County, in Josephine County, who have been ravaged um, by the lack of, of, of employment and are, are finding the same issues relative to poverty as a great portion of our state is. 
their students would be able to access that kind of instruction and perhaps reinvigorate their own local economies. So yes, I have been accused of wanting to change the social fiber of Springfield, so noted. Um, it appears that I may be taking on the rest of the state as well with the, with the fabulous partners that I have here in Springfield and across the state. So I thank you for the opportunity to share that work with you. Very early days, but we're very, very excited about the possibilities, and we thank you for your time today. Thank you, panelists. We'll have time for questions, and so I'll be thinking about your questions. I'd like to start out by just asking the panelists to think, uh, to talk with us about what are the good things that happen to a community when they move in the direction of becoming an innovation hub? What, what are some of those good outcomes? Why should we care about this? What would happen to us if we move in that direction? Yeah, just a, a quick comment. One thing I really loved about the, the last presentation there was, uh, I don't know if you meant to say this, but the yes and mentality of, you know, that's, that's, a, that's, a, great, that's a great way to think about it. These things, what, what we're aiming for is something that becomes self-sustaining, you know. That theater is what motivates people to be an entrepreneur. It's what motivates somebody to be a mentor to somebody in high school. That kind of thing where it seems like there's not a connection between them, but they are intimately connected. That's that's the type of energy that, that you want to see in a district like that. So, other panelists comments. <laughs> it's time to change the paradigm in Springfield. It's time to get back to the yes we can, yes we will, and yes it will happen. And again, I would only capstone that in the sense that uh, we already are. Um, and what has been fascinating to me in doing the work that, that I just um, recently shared with you is how fascinated others are about how this partnership has come to be. Uh, we were able to, um, you know, to provide a, a tour for the Mass Timber Conference that was held in Portland in um, over spring break. And um, at the mayor's request, we gave tours because the CLT had just been installed. My faculty pushed back hard, saying, Sue, it's no big deal, you know, we put it up, you know, it, these people see this stuff all the time, you know, I think you've made a mistake, and I said, okay, fine, if I have, I'll own it. Um, we brought a, this huge tour bus shows up, they, they go in and they get to see um, CLT for the first time actually installed. And my um, COO came back, and I won't say exactly what he said because it's not appropriate for this company, but it was to this tune, which was, it's like they saw fire for the first time, Sue. So it was awesome. <laughs> and so well, the reason I share that with you is that this is the thing that I, I continually appreciate about Springfield is, is this yes and, and you know, we just do it. We don't think about it. We do it, and then we're surprised that others are amazed that we're able to do it. Um, and so I think that's what's ahead. That, that's why I think this is is just tailor made for this community. We have a can do roll up our sleeves and don't tell us no attitude. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yes. Uh, I want to echo what Dr. Uh, Smith said. Uh, I'm from Eugene. Um, I do like, video games and the tech art scene. Uh, I try to be a community leader to create spaces for people. Um, without getting too political, Eugene is difficult sometimes to get gears kind of moving and uh, looking across the five, uh, we do see uh, can do spirit and that is very inspiring. Um, uh, but more to kind of what Matt was talking about with the lovely vision uh, of intersection we saw up there. Uh, in Springfield, are there, is there other sites that have been identified as possible hubs? Are there partners that have been identified as possible for construction or for, uh, for sponsorship? Um, because you know, myself and Courtney here as well, uh, we are ready to go. Our, our show is ready, we just don't know where to start being. Um, and so we're looking to you guys for answers on that. I do see Courtney recently in the room. I don't know if you were prepared to make a comment today, but you might be the best informed or Gino, one of the two of you. Yeah, I think I came to learn a little bit about the terminology around innovation hubs and innovation districts and distinctly understanding what the vision of the chamber and the community is around that. I know that we do look at our assets and we look at where energy is existing, especially out in Gateway. Um, and we know that there are resources and amenities and employers um, already doing incredibly innovative things. 
Um, so we're here to listen and to learn and, and to figure out what that partnership looks like. So the thing that does, as Sue alluded to, distinguish Springfield from a lot of other communities is that uh, we're an extraordinarily collaborative place and we, we just refuse to accept that something can't be done. And so pulling all those partners together, the city, school district, chamber, others, uh, we will find a way to help you to get something done that you're dedicated or that you're committed to trying to do. Yes. So I'm Noreen with United Way, and we're, we're right here in Gateway. Um, my question is, our vision is we want to create financial stability for the next generation, and that's a passion and a vision of ours. And so I imagine, I'm looking at you, Henry, I'm from Massachusetts, so I know the whole yoga you're talking about. Um, you know, there's got to be some data that, from these other locations, these other innovation districts that talks about or looks at the increasing the financial stability of this next generation. And so I'd be very curious if you if you're aware of that or if you if you could share that I would because I to me my intuition says absolutely this is going to be create greater opportunities for our students for the future. Yeah, I mean, um, so absolutely. I mean, that's that's one of the critical economic questions. Um, as far as as far as data, you know, we have to look more specifically at the local community. But what we see nationwide is a bifurcation of high wage, high income type, um, you know, growth, and also low wage and low income. And um, when that gets determined by where you were born or you know, race or ethnicity, that's where we really start to see a big breakdown. So that all, all data show, show that. And really, what's, what's fascinating about this type of activity, making sure that there are connections between industry and, um, and education systems, is to me that's just personal opinion. That's the way to break down that that, that connection. So, but yeah, I'll absolutely, it's a personal interest of mine, and we can talk more about data that, that kind of shows what the best approaches are. Other questions? Well, I was intrigued by the pictures that Matt showed, and I was talking to Judy, and that's in our community. I wasn't aware of that, and it's really cool to see that those types of venues are already available. I mean, granted, some of them are in a private sector, but they're at least embracing the concept of collaboration within the workforce, for the workplace. Yeah, Robert. Uh, Dr. Ricky Smith, could you talk a little bit about the current collaboration, I believe it's happening, between A3 and Ferdy Lab and that, that maker community? Is, is that happening? Yeah, thank you. Um, <coughs> Oh, yeah. Yep. Well, she bring that I use my principal voice. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yes, um, in fact, I just came from uh, one of my half day visits from A3 today. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, as part of my, my yearly practice, I make sure that I embed myself in a school, all of our schools, for half day, and do everything from sweeping floors with a custodian to teaching in classrooms. And um, it, it, it's a really useful practice for me to understand our system better. Uh, and, and have an opportunity to talk with our kiddos. And um, a number of the students today, they're getting ready for Confluence, which is um, uh, just an amazing, again, I tip the hat here to Dr. Golden for you know, having the vision around A3 and uh, really allowing students the opportunity to get to learn through uh, areas, through projects that, that interest them. And Ferdy Lab came up over and over and over again today uh, from students that, first because, oh my gosh, that Dr. Ricky said, I gotta walk all the way down there to Ferdy Lab. And, and the, other, the other piece, I said, it's good for your heart. The second is, um, the second but more important piece was, it, they saw it as a creative space in a way in which they could bring their ideas to fruition. Um, as entrepreneurs, and they've never thought of themselves as entrepreneurs before. So, you know, I think, you know, for me, I learned a tremendous amount from our charter partner, A3, in the sense of what do we need to now transfer and transplant into our comprehensive high schools uh, relative to, to that type of project. And uh, in terms of both Springfield and Thurston High Schools, there have been ongoing conversations with Fairy Law for that reason. How do we insert entrepreneur-type thinking um, into our CTE pathways? So students who you know catch fire, I think about 
um, Seth Sanfilippo at Urban Lumber. I mean, he is an absolute excellent example of a student um, you know, a, that then transferred uh, his love of long boards and wood products and those types of things and fascination with wood into a thriving business. Um, and so thank you for, for bringing that up, Robert. I think that that, that has been a, been a very intentional partner uh, with A3 and we're hopeful to you know, extend that in, into our comprehensives as well. Courtney? So what would this panel see as the first step to just starting on this idea of implementing an innovation hub or district? And, and I would also ask, what is the difference between a hub and a district? Uh, so I'll start with the second question first. Um, a, a, a district has a, a variety of components. So, so I think that the uh, Brookings Institute video uh, didn't have the audio on at first. And, and one of the things that they talk about is um, it's the new geography of, of innovation. And so it's, it's a high density area where a number of amenities are located geographically very close together. So, so that's the concept of a district. Uh, where, where things are walkable and he said hyper caffeinated. Um, the, the notion of a hub, I think of it as uh, conceptually as a single space. So, so some of those pictures showed a single space that is inclusive and, and open to all innovators uh, that, that brings people together. So it's, it's a single space. So that could be, could be located in downtown Springfield, it could be a, a building uh, in a gateway area. Um, but, it, but it's a single space, and, and you would want to probably locate it in proximity to other existing entities, so you'd be strategic about that. So in terms of first steps, I think maybe it would be a, a group of stakeholders who would talk about um, uh, terms of site selection and being strategic in that way. Uh, and one of the ingredients that we noted is, is high-speed access, and so there's fiber. Uh, Subhouse Fiber out to the Gateway area and also down Main Street. So both of those those areas are would be potentially considered. Um, and and you've got two tenants right here in the front row who are ready to go. So so that's a good start. So, so the question though is is that fiber lit? What do they have to do to do that? Ah, so uh, in terms of that conversation, um, I think we we've had. Um, uh, some early dialogue uh, with the city of Springfield and the Springfield Chamber and, and other folks about uh, completing those cross connects, uh, both in the north and south end of town. And so what that would look like specifically to um, uh, activate all of those sort of dormant assets here would be a, a small facility uh, that would be open access and carrier neutral and, and provide ISPs, uh, non-incumbent ISPs, access to uh, to that fiber. So um, a small facility may be co-located with the city or maybe with sub uh, in an area where there's the junction of the, the fiber. And then and they would come. They're already coming. And, and I think that there is a, a huge opportunity there to, to leverage the assets that Springfield already has. Let me just really quickly yes and that and say uh, that I absolutely agree. I think another reason Another distinction that tends to be made about the difference between a district and a hub, and the reason why we're not up here saying, you know, the Springfield Innovation District is because sometimes a, a district in Holyoke, for example, there's a very, you know, kind of stark distinction between on this block you're in the district and this block you're not. And that's not really the, the type of mindset that I think that I think we want to promote. And instead it would be something like, you know, with this hub at the center, we have assets to build on in Springfield, like a great transportation system that goes, uh, you know, towards the University of Oregon and towards the biggest tech employer in, in Lane County. So uh, that would be, you know, I would kind of add that on as well. So you asked about outcomes of the uh, innovation uh, district idea in terms of economics. Uh, a common thread that you've heard throughout this conversation has to do with um, collaboration and synthesis. Those are things that uh, seem to be interwoven throughout the entire discussion. And an example of an outcome through uh, collaboration and synthesis has to do with the work that Dr. Sue and Bonnie City are doing to pull businesses together with education. Sue is absolutely convinced in I've heard her say it publicly enough that I, I, can, I will repeat it here, uh, that she, she's, she's put a stake in the ground and said that through this, this integration 
uh, they are going to improve uh, CTE uh, to the point that it's going to have an impact, a significant impact on graduation rates in, in the community. Now that's, that's one measurable thing. Uh, the other side effects of that would be uh, the, the quality of education that students are going to be getting as a result. So th this idea of synthesis and collaboration is interwoven throughout the, all this discussion of innovation hubs. I have another question back there. Yes. Uh, so actually, this is a comment from one of our live viewers, uh, <laughs> Julie Anderson. Um, wait, let me pull it up here. Oh, I lost it. Where to go? Uh, basically, she's uh, she mentioned because you're talking about A3, especially with uh, uh, getting uh, people on board with and companies on board with education and things like that. She actually works for HP. And so she uh, mentioned that HP uh, donated some equipment and like a HP Sprout and things like that to to the A3 schools. And very recently, they were able to utilize that to help do some projects and stuff like that. Um, she she linked in, in the stream. She linked a little video that she made just the other day about um, about using the Sprout and, and using that. So that's a she. Thank you, Julie, for <laughs> tuning in and letting us know about uh, some specific examples of, of companies working with our educa educators to, to better student outreach and, and better student educational programs. Yes, Kate. Um, so I just wanted to mention, there we do, in Springfield, have a maker's district. Um, it's the Booth Kelly Maker's District. It's fairly new. Booth Kelly's a great area if you're looking for location in the downtown district. Um, and if you just go to boothkellymakers.org, you can learn all about the different businesses, the organizations that they represent. Springfield's on there, the city's on there, um, and that is headed also by the people who um, own Urban Lumber and a number of those other people who are really working to kind of renovate, revitalize downtown Springfield. Thanks. Yes? Um, you're been talking about the A3 school and then down, downtown, and I've uh, past employer, I've had one of your students as an intern for me, you know, when I was creative director of another company. Um, I'm a designer, and I've, I've been working in Eugene since 2012 as a, I run an artist uh, contemporary arts initiative. Um, I've had a residency space, and I've shown emerging artists around Eugene. Um, one of the things I notice a lot is that the U of O grads from the art department that I work with and show uh, usually leave town within a year. Uh, and this is the same for students from some of the other departments at the U of O. And so in thinking of A3 students, my question is, what about after school? And what I see Innovation Hubs doing is actually creating a culture and a place where people want to come, talent wants to move to and be a part of the community. And so it's like a next generation thing. You know, new families, new uh, creative workers, new digital workers, new game designers, new architects, new whatever. Um, so I'm wondering what kind of conversations you guys have had about that. To that point, um, when I when I first came came to Springfield, I'm, I learned that our staff at Springfield Public Schools, 75 percent of them were educated in Springfield by Springfield Public Schools and State. Uh, and I know that the younger generation, you know, they tend to go out, but they come back home, as I would love to say, to spawn. Uh, and, and so um, it, it, is, it is very much, you know, which is different than where I was in, in Salem. With Santa Kaiser School District, because it's primarily a government town, what you just described, they're educated and they, they take off. There isn't that same sense of, of coming back to community and giving to community. That's why, uh, once I got my head wrapped around that, uh, that, that's why I reached out to the chamber and to the city and said, okay, it's really clear to me, I'm not just educating students, I'm educating the, the future, and, and I'm forming, potentially, the future of this community for good or for ill. So right now we've got a poverty rate that is not what we want. We've got a free and reduced lunch rate that we don't want. Um, that tells us about economic instability. What can I do from my end to make that better and, and thus that partnership? So to your point relative to if there is a reason for them to stay, they will stay. Okay? They will they will reinvest in the community for a variety of reasons. A3 is interesting in the fact that um, not all of the students that go to A3 are, are, are Springfield students. They are from across the county. 
So it's a little different. Um, but I think that the, the same thing applies if they want to stay within, within the county if we give them a reason to do that. The students that are, are within our system, in terms of the traditional system, the, the comprehensives, um, they will return home. Last night we had our retirement uh, uh, celebration and we always give out scholarships to teachers, uh, to, to students. And I was impressed by, every year I'm impressed by the number of students who because of what they've experienced in Springfield Public Schools say, I'm not going to be an elementary educator or I'm going to be a secondary educator or I want to be an educator in CTE. I mean, they know that there's a reason to come back and continue to give to their community. We just have to create, continue to create the reasons and give the, give the reasons uh, for them to want to do that. Uh, along the lines of talent retention, that, that's something that uh, TAO and our members are intimately um, uh, activated in. And so uh, one of the programs that exists is Experience Or Tech, where U of O students, uh, and now more recently, uh, uh, high school students across the county, including a busload from A3, visited great tech companies like CBT Nuggets and Rain and Furry Lab uh, over over on the other side of I-5, and and as part of that, um, a number of students um, like me as a kid, like I rem my whole world was like the 7-Eleven that I could ride my bike to, and maybe the Albertsons that my mom shopped at, and the Red Lion restaurant where my mom worked. Like that was my whole world. And, and so putting my mindset, the kid from Springfield, and put him on a bus, and you take him to a place like CBT Nuggets, and they get to walk into that lobby there, it changes your whole world. It changes your entire career trajectory. So, so the numbers that, that were mentioned are 53% of Lane County students live in poverty. Average wage in tech is 74,000. Median is still above 60. So these, these are high wage jobs, the fastest growing sector in our economy, and so um, talent retention matters. We have active internships uh, with A3 students right now. We have active job shadows with A3 students right now. We have 26 tech companies that are hosting uh, students and teachers uh, this summer for paid uh, professional development internships across the board. So we're, we're excited about the future for Springfield Schools. So just in terms of outcomes, I've just heard several things. One is uh, more will have a higher graduation rate. More students that do graduate won't be going to San Francisco or Seattle or Portland to look for work. There'll be jobs right here that appeal to them. And then the third outcome is that the jobs are higher paying, higher wage jobs, they're family wage jobs. So those are three concrete outcomes of what we're talking about. Other uh, questions? Yeah, Sean. What do you see being a good uh, tipping point for us to create this, like an innovation of here? So, like an oleo that building came in, and that was a tipping point from from A to B. I, I hear that we have fiber, it's not connected. I hear that we have this, but it's not ready. What's it? What's for We're close? Field, yeah. What's it? What's a tipping point? What would actually get to the other side? Yeah. So that's that's a. Uh, that's a really critical question, right? So uh, I certainly don't, as, as, a, as a state employee, I'm not suggesting that I'm going to personally fund, you know, a giant computing center. That's exactly what, I, what I'm saying, you know, that that these kind of, uh, these huge investments are things that come along every once in a while that you have to prepare for. Can you depend on it? Of course not. So uh, to me, what, what seems to make the most sense and it's working in the most places in the United States seems to be, um, the energy around a particular set of initiatives to be really opportunistic. You know, what can we do this year with this amount of money, with um, this energy? Where do I put my energy? That's rather than a, a single investment being the tipping point. To, to be honest, at Napoleo, that was just an excuse because the people that are coming in and using that space are not using terabytes of data to learn how to code or to learn how to repair a bike. It's much more of a an attitude, an attitude shift is, I think, the best way to think about it. I can go more specific. Um, uh, that was one of the things that I, I learned about your presentation was about the high performance computing uh, uh, over there. And it turns out that we have one of those that just came online at U of O. And it also turns out that they are cross connected on sub fiber. So uh, I think that we could put together a grant proposal to the Mozilla Foundation with money that we've already won with Springfield school, uh, school students to leverage the high performance computing facility at U of O across that network 
and uh, have that be a pilot that inspires. So there you go, how about that? I just wanted to add on to that a little bit. Um, besides doing the Eugene Tech stuff, I started the Coach Shop's co-working space six years ago above the barn light, before the barn light was there. And so I know I've been watching that co-working space uh, you know, industry, I guess you could call it, pretty closely. And we're always on the we're always on the edge of opening up another space because there's enough pressure of people who want to use a co-working space kind of thing. And so um, you, you could probably just replicate that, do a high-end kind of uh, boutique co-working space, put it right next to Plank Town or where you know somewhere within walking distance of the Washburn and Plank Town and, and all that stuff, and make it high-end and 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 uh, charge a decent price, and I think you'd be surprised how quickly it would fill up. And you get to leverage kind of what's going on with the um, office uh, price per square foot, what's going on right now in Eugene. Um, some people are getting priced out of this, like co co-working, or it's like, I, I used to be able to, like, if I was a very small business, I could get a very small office for a reasonable rate. And as that's turning over and, and the, uh, that downtown innovation district is maturing, people are kind of getting pushed out. And so you can leverage some of that. Um, anyway, just wanted to share that Great. point. If you want to do that, I can help. <laughs> so we've got time for maybe one more question. Last question, anybody? Bonnie? Yes. <laughs> I'm playing it on tape. Sorry. <laughs> she was giving me the now. next great idea. Yeah. So we're yes. just wrapping it up. Yes. Uh, so are you ready to um, wrap it up? All right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks for your participation and interest. Uh, it, it was as exciting as I had hoped it would be. Thank you, panelists. Thanks, Tao, for putting it together. Can I say one more thing? So um, I put together, uh, as a workforce analyst, uh, economic indicators for the county. If you're interested in any particular information, any economic data, or want to be a part of that, I uh, left the sign-up sheet in the back there. You can have a look at a historical example, the way it keeps track of what's going on in our economy. And please let me know if you have any questions that I can help provide data on. And Henry is right. He's a great resource. I uh, can't thank you enough, Henry. Matt, thank you for the idea and the plug to our friends at Mozilla. We're going to get right on that. Uh, and Tammy, great work for many, many years. And Sue, as always, thank you for your partnership and your leadership in our school district. We are going to get on this. I want to call attention to a couple of things. First and foremost, there are uh, these small cards. You can, if you are interested in following uh, along with us our conversations around the Innovation District, Innovation Hubs, as they progress, and we know they will, please either leave us a uh, page or Robert in the back your business card and let us know or fill one of these out and we'll make sure you're on that email list and invite you to follow up uh, stakeholder conversations as they come about. Also, we have a couple of really important and fantastic programs we don't want you to leave without knowing about. On June 6th, we have a program uh, we've invited, and he's accepted, Kelly Graves, the University of Oregon women's basketball coach, to come talk to us about leadership and how he is he was able to cultivate an elite team. So it's going to be very inspiring. Beth Smith is also going to be there. That's June 6th. It'll be at LCC Center for Meeting and Learning. We'll sign you up. If you want us to, leave us your business card. Otherwise, you can find it on the Chamber website. But that's June 6th, and we really hope to see you there. There are a couple others here. Talking Transit, that's our Gateway Development Committee, who has pulled together a special program to talk about the Gateway MX Loop and the Business After Hours. Lo and behold, it's Sylvan Ridge. So we're going to be uh, making a cheers. We won't have, won't have beer, probably, but we will have wine. Once again, thank you so much to our panelists. Great discussion. Thank you, everyone, for coming and participating in ACT. We hope you go away inspired, and we hope to see you back as we start to move this conversation forward. Thank you again.
With all the uh, improvements on the, right, wait, uh, are still the streaming, are we still streaming? Oh. All right, that's the show. I don't know if you can see me. All right. See you next Tuesday. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, thank you, Julie, um, and Dave, and John, uh, and everybody. And, and uh, we'll see you later. With the chamber. Hi.